Hallelujah. And so I want us to stand as we receive the word of God this morning. I want us to stand on our feet. Amen. And I want us to receive the gift of God. This is an amazing man of God. He's a great author and a gift to the body of Christ. And so I want us to receive the word of God with an open heart. And I want us to receive the gift of God with an open heart. Amen. This man is called Radido Doso. Amen. Amen. So I want us to put our hands together as we receive <laughs> Pastor Radido Doso. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Buana Yesu asifiwe. Praise the Lord. God is good. And all the time. That is his nature. You also look good. It looks good from here. <laughs> it looks good from here. Buana Yesu asifiwe. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. You know, this day is a gift that God has prepared for all of us that we may enjoy. One of the things that God wants us to do is to enjoy. So when you live your life, make sure that you spare time to do what? To enjoy. Don't just frown from morning to evening. Find some time and enjoy. Because if you don't enjoy, then you're not, um, you're not taking the blessing seriously. One as if you were sana. So this morning, I'm so glad to be here um, by the mercies of God. He has made it possible that I be here, of course, under the gracious invitation of your pastor, uh, a lovely friend of mine, a passionate servant of God, and a special gift in our time. Bonus if you son. If you know what he carries, then you understand what I'm saying. If you do not know what he carries, then find out what he carries so that you can begin to understand why we consider him a special grace, a special gift. Of course, together with your wife, I've not seen her today. I don't know whether she's... Okay. All right. Um, we honor her in her absence, and we recognize the grace and the gift that God has placed in her life. Born as if you were son. So this morning, we have come that we may reflect on the word of God. Born as if you were... What I have brought today is just a message, a good, a, a message um, from, from the word of God, a message that is supposed to help us uh, improve the quality of our relationship with God and the quality of our Christian life. One as if you were sana. So we came to reflect on the word of God. You know, the scripture says that man shall not live by bread alone, but he lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That means when God speaks, we find something by which we can live. Everything that God has said is supposed to be building our lives. It's supposed to be guiding our lives. It's supposed to be helping our lives. So if you are a serious human being, then you should be careful about what God has said and what God is saying. So that as you do your other things, you find some time to feed on the word of God. Because it is the word of God that gives us life. Because you cannot live by bread alone. We live by the word of God. So as you eat your meals, make sure you are also eating the word. And if you are a wise person, eat more word than you eat food. Eat more word than you eat food. So that is why we have come. So before we go into the word, I'll make a short prayer and then I will invite you to take your seats. And then we shall um, take a feast on what God has prepared for us this morning. Let's bow our head and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you because you're a good God. It has pleased you, O oh God, that in this gathering, Jehovah Father, we eat of the word of God and we drink from the well of God. How I pray that the eyes of our understanding will be open so that the spirit of God will speak and we shall hear. Father, may your word enter into our hearts, our spirits and souls because the entrance of the word of God brings about life. 
and we have come that we may encounter that word that life may be imparted in us in Jesus name oh how I pray that by the end of this service today our faith in you will be increased our confidence in you will be increased our hope in you will be increased in the name of Jesus Christ Father God, anything that is in us that is troubled, Jehovah Father, upon hearing the word, it shall be brought to order in the name of Jesus Christ. Any one of us who came to be strengthened, they shall be strengthened. Any one of us who came to be fed, they shall be fed. Any one of us who came to be encouraged, they shall be encouraged. Any one of us who came to be blessed, they shall be blessed. Any one of us who came, oh God, to encounter you, they shall see you in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray, oh God, that our lives will never be the same again because we came. The Bible says that they shall move from strength to strength. Them that appears before the Lord in Zion. Behold, we have come on Zion. Behold, we are standing on the mountain. We want to encounter God that we may be moved from one level of glory to another in the name of Jesus Christ. Every family represented here is blessed. Every business represented here is blessed. Every company represented here is blessed. Every house represented here is blessed. Everyone represented here, oh God, is blessed. Because they shall be blessed them that appears before the Lord. We have come to be blessed. 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 To be blessed. And we declare that we are blessed because we came in the name of Jesus. We give you glory and honor because this is your day and these are your people. This is your meeting for your agenda. Glory and honor be to your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Before you sit down, turn to five people and give them a high five and tell them, it is good you came. Tell them again, it is good you came. Hallelujah. Give them a beautiful smile. Make somebody feel good. That um, they are in the house of God today. Then you can have your seat in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The servant of God, David, said that I was glad. When they told me, let us go into the house of God. One important thing about the house of God is that you get an opportunity to encounter God. To encounter God. If there is anything we must strive as believers to experience in the days of our lives is God. You know the way people say, I have had an opportunity to travel abroad. I've had an opportunity to ride on a plane. I've had an opportunity to meet the president. I've had an opportunity to go to state house. I've had an opportunity to make a million shillings. I've had an opportunity to see gold or to touch it. I've had an opportunity to see whatever kind of things people are saying. If there is an opportunity we should all desire is to encounter God. Because all those things I have mentioned, none of them compares to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may have gone to America and back. But if you have not encountered God, then you have not tested something good. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. You may have a lot of money in your bank account. You may be a millionaire. Because I know there are some millionaires who are seated in our midst today. Hallelujah. You may be a millionaire. But if you have not run into God, encountered God, experienced God, heard from God, been touched by God, then there is something you are still missing. The biggest thing that can happen in the life of a human being is this thing called encountering God. Because encountering God has potential to impact your natural and spiritual life. It leaves a lasting impact. The people who encounter God, they have different stories to tell. They have different reports to give. They have a different perspective of life. They have a different power by which they run. I don't want to have everything else and miss God. I'd rather miss all those things, but I have God in my company. Because the biggest thing you can ever have is God. 
When you have God, then you have everything that any serious person would desire to have. Because it is powerful to walk in the company of God. It is powerful to walk in the company of God. If God shows up in your business, or he shows up in your house, or he frequents you wherever you go, you know you have an advantage over other people. Because when you walk in the company of God, you're walking in the company of power. I'm talking about power. Power that cannot be opposed by any other power, regardless of how much they have, they have coalesced or joined together. The power of God cannot be opposed by any other power. His power is supreme power. So when you walk in the company of God, you're walking in the company of power. When you walk in the company of God, you're walking in the company of life. You see life. The life of God cannot be killed by death. So when you have God in your company, even if you die, you shall live. Hallelujah. So in the company of God, life does not end. Like you cannot exhaust that resource. You live continually in the company of God. In the company of God, you are working with omniscience. Omniscience means knowing everything. So that when you're in the company of God, there is nothing that is hidden from you. Even the secrets of men can be revealed to you. And you do not have to be there to discuss those secrets. God reveals them to you. Because you are working with omniscience. You know everything about everything in the company of God. In the company of God, you, 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 you are going to experience peace. Peace. The peace that cannot be troubled by trouble. Bonasifuesana. It doesn't matter how much trouble they try to make. When you're in the company of God, you are encapsulated in peace. So that nothing can break into that zone to disturb that peace. In the company of God, you are walking with joy. Joy means sorrow cannot unsettle you. You cannot be stressed. You cannot be troubled. You cannot be anxious. In the company of God, people don't get anxious. In the company of God, you cannot be attacked. When they try to attack you, he confuses them, he fights them. He blocks them, he blinds them. And he causes them to be destroyed in their own schemes. So there is something powerful about encountering God. So as you tell us about your achievement, please remember to mention whether or not you have encountered God. <laughs> Don't just tell us you have 100 acres of land and you have properties in Nairobi. That's okay. That's a good thing to have. But if in your list of achievements you don't mention and I have encountered God you know your list is incomplete it's even a weak list to present as a list Christ, is, Christ says that seek you first the kingdom of God as a matter of priority the first thing we seek is the kingdom and his righteousness and then all these other things that's why I'm saying if you are to begin to mention your achievements, as a matter of priority, begin by a report about your encounter with God. Because that's how it begins. That's where we start, and then we can mention all these other things as additions. All these other things are just additions. Bonus if you were son. So as you live your life, one of the things you will strive to do is to have a moment of encounter with God. Moment of encounter with God. Beyond praying for blessings and healing and money and wealth, pray that one day you will run into God and encounter him. Because that is going to be the day of change for your life. Because people change when they, they encounter God. People change when they encounter God. When you encounter God, you change. One time Moses climbed uh, on top of the mountain to have time with God. And he stayed there 40 days. I think you have read that story. The Bible says that when he climbed down, when he climbed down, his face was now glowing. 
like, like the sun until they told him, hey, you know you're glowing, you are spoiling our eyes. Cover your head. <laughs> and you see, Moses was not even aware that he was glowing. They had to tell him that he's, he has changed. He has changed. That is not how he, he looked like when he went. And that is what happens when people have encountered God. When they come back, their lives are glowing. Their lives are shining. They are no longer ruled by, 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 um, by, um, by timidity and fear. They suddenly become bold. They become courageous. If they were foolish before, suddenly they begin to operate in wisdom. If they are weak before, suddenly they are strong. You know, if they were poor, suddenly they become rich. This is what happens when people run into God. If you run into God, a sick person, you are coming out a healthy human being. If you run into God, a confused man, when you come back, you are a man of sobriety. If you run into God, if you run into God, a weak man, when you come back, you are strong. If you run into God, a fearful man, when you come back, you are a bold man. So one of the things you want to do in the few days that God has given us to be alive here on earth is to pray that God, I want to encounter you. This prayer is not for adults only. This prayer is for everybody. Because there are some children who have encountered God at an early age. And when you listen to them, you just know that this is different. So don't wait until you are very old. To make this prayer. Pray this early. Pray this early. Pray this early. Pray it every day. Desire God. Crave God. Have a craving for God. Drive him crazy with petitions that I want to see you. And when you get an opportunity before God, don't, don't be troubled with long lists of things. You know, for many years now, people have this list of things that every time they get an opportunity before God, they usually present. You know your list, right? Those things you've been praying for. And some of them have been on the list for very long. Oh, God bless me with a car. Oh, God bless me with a car. <laughs> it's not bad to pray for a car. That's a good thing. Oh, God bless me with a wife. Oh, God bless me with a wife. Lord bless me with a husband. The, everybody has a list. This list consumes our attention. And if you do a good study, if people can show you their lists, very few people have this thing I'm talking about on their list. We don't pray for this. We don't pray for it. We just have this list of, of food and clothes and health and, and bless me and bless my children and bless my husband. You, you know that list. Can you see your list? <laughs> Some of you are looking very guilty. There is a list. Everybody has a list of prayer items that we've been presenting before God. You know, it is not bad to have those, that list. But I am challenging you today to go and change your list. Just go before God with one item that I may see you. Because that item, when it is answered, all other things have been answered. You know? And God usually pays more attention to that item. The people who have craved for God with that one agenda, usually, they are blessed. Because that is a priority thing. When God is answering prayers, he answers them according to priority. And the priority of God is not first come, first serve. No. Or ladies first. There is nothing like that. There is no ladies first. There is no first come, first serve. He is looking at the quality of the items you are presenting before him. How close is that list of viewers to the agenda of God? How close is it to the agenda of God? If your list is very far from the agenda of God, he will answer you. But he will answer you after he has answered those other priority things. I'm telling you. Begin to press before God with this one prayer that I may see you. That I may encounter you. Just that. Because I'm telling you the truth. Even if you don't pray for health, if God shows up for you, 
even your sicknesses will be wiped off. Bwana asifiwe sana. Even your poverty cannot stand in the presence of God if you are a custodian of his power. There is no way you will be poor when God is with you. How? How does that happen? How does that happen? It doesn't happen like that. Now, if you look at the prayer of Solomon when he was praying for whatever he prayed for, and if you look at the list of things that he came out of that prayer with, you will know that I'm telling you the truth. Because that man did not pray for wealth. He did not pray for fame. He did not pray for all those things that he's known for. He was just asking for one thing. Lord, give me wisdom to know how to lead these your children. Just one item. Just one. Just one item. Kitungapi? Moja. If you do not know how to pray, why don't you copy Solomon? Ambia tu mungu mini mekuja tu vile Solomon alikam. Ata kama uta nipatia 100%. Uki nipatia ata ka 40% of what went to Solomon. Do you know what that means? If God gives you 40% of what was given to Solomon. You are bigger than the, the richest person in the world today. Buona sifiwe sana. That's why I'm telling you, desire God. Desire what? God. God. And I'm not saying that list is bad. It is okay to have that list. But if those 30 minutes you have before God can be used for a quality item, one thing that is an answer to all things, one thing that is an answer to all things, I would go for that thing. I would go for that thing. So desire God. Desire God. So issue number one, go and check your list again. Everybody has a list, I know. Because even me, I have mine. <laughs> Tulizaliwa na list, my friend. Na ukiendelea kukua mkubwa ndiyo list inakuwa mrefu. So the best thing to do is to stick to one. The one thing that if God answers for you is an answer to all things. That is the thing you should pray for. Even if you'll pray for it for five years, I am telling you after your five years of prayer are over, you will stop praying. Do you know Solomon did not go back to pray that prayer again? He never prayed it again. It was a one-time prayer. And when it was answered, the man began to operate. And that is how it was. That is how it was for him. So press on one thing. Press on one thing that you may encounter God. Now, today, I want to share with us the word of God. And as I said, I want us to reflect. That means to think about the things that we are going to pick from the word of God today. As has been said, by the grace of God, I am, I am, I am an author. I have written a number of books. And I am continuing to do that because, because God is helping me. God is helping me. When I was young, when I was a little young, I read the Bible and I saw, I saw the story of Daniel, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and I saw the story of Paul, and I saw the story of, um, of, um, the story of, uh, of Joseph and of Gideon. Now, this man they really inspired me. They really inspired me. And also the story of David. They really inspired me. So I began to pray. I began to pray for the spirits of these men to come on me. That is what I was praying for. That is when my list started changing. I knew I was supposed to be praying for a job and for everything else. And coming from a poor family, I come from a poor family. We used to be poor. These days we are not. <laughs> you know, let me tell, tell you a small story. My mom, my mom came from a family where only boys were allowed to go to school. My mom. So when she tried to go to school, she reached class two. And then she was told, ah, where? Shule. And she was born in a family where there, are more, there were more boys. So, I was raised by a class two 
uh, dropout. I did not know that my mom was a class two dropout until I finished university. And one time we sat down to talk about some things. And then that's when she told me, you know what? Me, I did not go to school like you. You have an advantage. That's when I discovered that my mom was a class two dropout after university. Now, I began to feel like my mom was playing me because when I was in high school, I would bring home the reports and we would discuss subjects. And I would tell her, this is chemistry, I've scored this one. And my mom would advise me. And we are discussing very technical subjects. Now we are discussing biology, chemistry, mathematics, physics, all those things. And she never created an impression that she does not know what chemistry is or biology or physics. We just talked about them. And she's telling me, you know, physics, you're not supposed to have this score. If you can score maths like this, I think physics you can also. <laughs> My mom was a very interesting, you know. So we talked about serious things. But I never knew that she's a class two dropout. Never. When they chased me from school, because they chased me from high school, many times, because, because there was no school fee. So how I paid my school fee is, when they chased me out, I would go and bring my mom as school fees. And then I tell her, you go to the office. And while you are talking, me, I'll go to the... <laughs> Some of you have done that, right? Some of you are even doing it. It works. That is school fees enough. So you just go. Just go and tell the teacher, let the child go back to class as we talk. So while they are talking, me, I'm doing what? I'm in class, I'm learning. So when they chased me from school, I would go home and bring my mom. And I let her go to the office. I don't know what they were talking about. I even don't know how she talked to them. Because in high school, those are people who have gone to school, right? But my mom would have conversations with them. And they talked and talked and talked. In primary school, my mom would get a rare opportunity to to be, to be the mother of the best performing students, to give a speech. And she used to love those things. She used to tell us, hey, you better perform well so that I come and give a speech. So she would come to school and give a speech in front of parents. So these days I'm asking myself, was that a class two person talking to parents who had gone to school like that? <laughs> so that was the story of my mom. So I never knew until I finished uh, college and we talked. You know, when you have finished, now you have some courage to ask your parents some questions without fearing anything, right? That is when I discovered that she had not gone to school. But if I, looking at how she lived, because my mom speaks seven different languages, all vernacular languages, it is these days that she is trying some English, you know? But she speaks seven different languages. Me, with my school, I only speak three. I only speak three. So, something tells me, hata kama uyo mama kuenda shule, kuna mali alienda, watu wanafanya nini? Wanafunzwa. Because, how do you, how do you, how many of you speak more than four languages here? Four. Sasa wako kwa ligi ya my mom. Zote zonyo unazumuza ni ngapi? Five, six, eight. That's how I'm machine. That's how. What could you? Me, my mom speaks seven, seven. And because she was a business lady, she used to go to the market and she used to sell um, vegetables by the roadside and roasting maize. So I think she was learning this language when she's going to the market. So they are talking to other fellow women and they are she's speaking it and and now she mastered seven of them. That's a very beautiful thing. So that's the kind of family I came from. A big family. We have so many children. My, my dad was blessed with very many children. And uh, by the grace of God, God has preserved us. And God is using all of us in an interesting way to advance the agenda of the kingdom, which is a very good thing. So, I was talking about the day my list changed. When I began to read the Bible, I saw the names of those people that I have just mentioned. And that is what helped me to change my prayer items. So I began to pray for the spirits of those men to come upon me. The spirit of those men. The spirit that was making Solomon to, to operate in wisdom. I prayed that the spirit of wisdom comes upon me. The spirit that was on David to be a man after God's own heart. I pray that it comes upon me. The spirit that was in Daniel and Shadrach and Gideon and Joseph. 
I prayed for those spirits. The whole time when I was in high school, I used to pray for spirits. I never prayed for many things. Even grades, I didn't pray for grades. I just worked hard. <laughs> I just worked hard for the grades. But I prayed for the spirits. I was praying for nine different spirits. So I was saying, if David can be found in me and Solomon and Daniel and Joseph and Gideon, that would be a powerful man. Now imagine that. Imagine a man that has all those spirits. Because sometimes you only have one or two spirits. But if you can pray for those spirits to come upon you, then your life begins to change. So that when you begin to excel in life, in certain things, and people wonder, where did you get that from? You tell them, it is a spirit that was given to me as an answer to a prayer that I was praying for. Because there is a spirit you need for you to excel. When you have that spirit, then excelling is not something that you struggle to do. You know, there is a spirit you must have to create wealth. There is a spirit you must have to create wealth. If I give this man wealth, and I give this man the spirit to make wealth, after a while, the wealth of this man will go to this one. Because if he doesn't have the spirit to make that wealth, he will lose it. So, it is the spirit that produces those results. So when Solomon was praying to God, Lord, give me the spirit of wisdom. He wanted to produce leadership success. That is, is a product of having that spirit. That is why in the reign of Solomon, there was no war. It was just peace and just kingdom expansion and, and, and excellence. The reign of Solomon was just a peaceful reign. People did not fight. Solomon did not go to war. He was just enjoying, basking in, in excellence because he's just putting order to things and, and everything is in place. So there is a spirit you have for you to produce a particular thing. So, when the spirits that I prayed for came on me, then I began to manifest some things. I began to manifest some things. So that when people ask me, how come you're doing this thing and you did not go to school for it, I tell them, uh, school is not the only way you get to know how to do things. Sometimes it is an impartation from God when he puts that spirit on you. There are people that have been gifted with the spirit of creativity. And when they show up, they are able to create things. You, you have been there, but you did not see it. But then they just show up and they see something. There are people who have been gifted to make music. They make music. They don't struggle making music. In fact, music follows them everywhere. They are in the bathroom, there is a song. They are in the kitchen, there is another song. They are on a border border, there is a song. They don't struggle to make music. There are people who have been gifted to lead. Everywhere they go, leadership is happening. So when the spirit has come upon you, you begin to operate. You begin to produce the results or the consequences of having that spirit. That is why I'm telling you, pray that you encounter God. Because when you encounter God, the spirit of God enters you. When the spirit of God enters you, living a righteous life is not something that you practice. You know, there are people who must practice to do right. <laughs> but there are some men who don't practice doing right. It is just in their DNA. They just feel like that is the thing that should be done. So how do you pray unless the spirit of prayer is put on you? Do you know how difficult it is to pray? It is so hard. Those of you who have tried fasting, do you know how hard it is to do that thing? People who fast because they are, they are doing it naturally, they usually put that food aside to be eaten some other time, right? <laughs> so, and they call it fasting. So in the evening when they, when they look at their watch and say, yeah, it's 6.30. It is 6.30. So I'll, I'll eat lunch and then I do supper. I hit it so hard so that tomorrow I have fuel to run the whole day. <laughs> because it is possible to have food in your stomach before you start fasting, right? <laughs> and then you, you use that food. So fasting is not just putting food in your mouth. It's also not having food in there. 
in the stomach. So if you have food, then you start fasting. You, you are not fasting. Because there is food in your system. So there are people who do that. But there are some people who have been given the spirit. They can fast. They can really fast. And their fasting is not avoidance of food. They are fasting as a different dimension that does not even talk about food. They are now talking about entering into depths with God. Because if you are fasting just to eat for a certain time so you can eat, and you are doing nothing in between in terms of experiencing God, then your fast is not, is not, is not fasting. Your fast should take you to certain depths with God so that when you come out, we are feeling the spirit of God oozing from you. There is some dimension of the divine that has come upon you because you entered into fasting. Giving. Giving is powered by a spirit. You cannot give until that spirit comes upon you. And if you give when that spirit is not on you, then your giving is different. You are concerned about how much is going out. And you are also concerned about what will I get in? In return. And you know, proper giving does not consider those things. Proper giving delights itself in pouring out. Pouring out. Actually, people who are inspired by the spirit of giving do not even want to, people to know that they give. They give in secrecy. They just give in secrecy. They tell you, don't say I did it to you. Don't even look for me afterwards. Those are the givers that are being, that are, that are being inspired by the spirit of giving. They don't wait for, for them to see a need. Because there are people who are moved with compassion. But there are some people who will be woken up from some place and they are told, go and give. Even before they see the need. Those two types of giving are different. One is inspired by natural response to need. And another one is being pushed by the spirit of giving. So when you encounter God, then the spirit of God is deposited in you. And therefore you begin to operate on a different level. That's why I said people who have encountered God are different. So um, some of the books I have written are here. Um, I'm not going to talk about them a lot because I want to spare time to discuss what I want us to discuss today. What I'm going to discuss with us today will be coming from one of the books that I have done lately. It is called Faith in Action. Activate and exercise your faith. I'm talking about what it means to enter into faith and what it means to dispense yourself um, as a believer. So most of the things I'm going to talk about are coming from from this book. Let us read the book of John chapter 3 and verse 16. This is a common verse most of us have read. Most of us can even recite it. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have an everlasting life. That is a beautiful verse. We know it offhead, but it is loaded. There are, there are three things that are happening in that text. But I want to draw our attention to one thing, which I think is the most important. The Bible says that moved with love, God gave. Moved with love, God gave. So he made available the gift a product of his love. That is why I say those who are giving because of the spirit of giving, they give differently. So in this case, God is giving because he loved. Are you seeing? So his giving is inspired by, by love. So he loved first and then he gave. And I think the best way of giving is to love first. The best way of giving is to love first. Because if your giving is not founded on love, then that is like making noise, right? So the best way to give is to love first. So before you give, you check whether you love. Because when there is love, giving becomes almost natural. How many of you know that the person you love, 
you, can, you do not know how to control them from accessing things that you own. How many of you know that that is true? The person you love, that person has the advantage of access. They can access anything. Ado kijaribu kukata. Unakata lakini unakata kukubali kubali. It is hard. It is hard to deny the person you genuinely love the things they want from you. Because denying them is like punishing yourself because they, it will make you feel bad. So the best way to give is to love first. When you are in love, you don't struggle giving because giving comes naturally. So if you want to give to God, don't prepare giving. Prepare loving. Don't prepare giving. Prepare loving. I'd rather you stay 10 years before you give because you're working on your love. Because the moment you will love enough, you give even yourself. There is nothing you leave behind when you have totally loved. You pour it out. You go beyond what has been set as a standard. Because your giving is inspired by love. Now the Bible says that he loved and therefore he gave. And then it says, so that whoever believes may not perish but have an everlasting life. So, there are three things that are happening in this text. There is a God who is giving because he has loved. But then there, is, there, is, there are people here who are supposed to enjoy the product of God's love. They are supposed to enjoy it. But, the condition is they must believe. They must believe. So, God has availed the products of his love. But he says, this is only accessible to those who will believe. So that the availability of that blessing does not necessarily mean accessibility. The fact that God has loved and availed the gift does not mean that it is accessible to everybody. He says, only those who do what? Who believe. When they believe, that is when they access. So that when God is moving from this direction with love toward us, he is expecting that we move from this direction with faith toward him. So in our relationship with God, faith is more important than love. You are supposed to believe God. Before you start saying, oh, I love my God. No, believe him first. Because the foundation of our relationship with God is this small thing called faith. You do not start a relationship with God until you believe. The Bible says, and those who come to him must believe. Must believe that he is. It is a must. So in our relationship with God, faith is a is a must. You do not have a choice. You may decide to give or you decide not to give. But believing, you cannot decide. It is a must. So in our relationship with God, faith is a must. We are supposed to believe without ceasing. Every day is a believing day. As long as you're talking about God. So the labor of our Christian walk is to Believe. Every day, believe. Even if you don't pray, you must believe. Even if you don't come to church, you must do what? So we don't stop believing. We don't stop believing. The labor of our salvation is that we are supposed to continually believe. The moment you walk out of faith, you have walked out of God. Because there is no other access point for us, for God. There is just one keyhole called faith. 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 And Jesus Christ said this many times. Whatever you ask for in prayer, if you believe, you will have it. <laughs> yes, if you believe. There is no escape route when it comes to faith. You must believe. Every day is a believing day. Every day is a what? A believing day. Every day is a believing day. So the Bible says that God has 
God has availed the blessing of the gifts that he has that is coming from his heart that is full of love. But he says, whoever believes. So access to the blessings of God is made possible by this password called faith. God is like Wi-Fi. God is like Wi-Fi. Those of you who know Wi-Fi. Uneza kuwa umeingia mahali unasikia hapa kuna Wi-Fi. Now the signal is very strong. Imefika, zimefika 1, 2, 3, 4. Imeja, mpaka juu. But you cannot access unless you know the password. So that is how God is. He is available with a lot of blessing. He is available with a lot of what? Blessing. But only people who believe in him can access the blessing. That is why I said the most important thing you should do or strive to experience in your life is God. Kama uneza pata password ya hiyo wifi ya God uingie hapo uconnect sasa ni ma downloads tu zinafanya nini? Zinakuja. Let me tell you something. There is an interesting story in the Bible of a woman who the Bible calls the woman with the issue of blood. This woman this woman inspires me. The Bible says that she had suffered for many years. Was it 12 years? And she had tried all, all options. She had gone to the hospital. She had gone to anything. She had used her resources to try and cure the problem. But it could not. And so she told herself, she told herself, if I can go and just touch the hem of Jesus' garment, then this thing will be healed. So, the password she used to access the Jesus Wi-Fi is this thing called faith. She believed. Now, this thing she was saying was not prayer. She was not praying. She was talking to herself. She was talking to herself, right? She, did not, she was not making a prayer. She talked to herself. And then, she lifted her faith toward Christ. And when she went and connected with Christ through that act of faith, of just touching, there is something that was downloaded from Christ into her life. That's why I'm telling you, God is like Wi-Fi. And the people who are enjoying massive downloads are people who have password. So when she touched, her gadget connected to the Wi-Fi. And then instant download happened. Pa! And then Jesus said, somebody has downloaded something. <laughs> has somebody ever hacked into your Wi-Fi and then they download a movie? You check your balance bundles. I look 25 GB. Say, I'm 16. Somebody has downloaded something. Kuna mtu wame hacki Wi-Fi na wame download kitu. That is what Jesus felt. Somebody hacked into the Wi-Fi and then downloaded something. And then Jesus said, Somebody has downloaded something. And so they were asking, what's wrong with you? There are many people here. How can you say that? Jesus says, no, 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 no. There is somebody who has downloaded a file. I have felt a file leaving me. <laughs> there is a file that has left me. Somebody has downloaded the file. And then she says, I am the one who has downloaded the file. Do you know what Jesus tells her? Your faith has made you whole. The conversation was not about the, the, the file. The conversation was about who, who gave you the password? Because she came with a password called faith. She did not pray to God. She spoke to herself. The only prayer she made, if at all it is, it is believing that my touching this man is what will download that healing file into my life. And I'm telling you, when she touched, she was made whole instantly. She actually felt like there is a change in my body. The issue stopped. The issue stopped. And now Jesus tells her, your faith has made you whole. So the whole conversation about this whole thing that's going on here is about faith. 
Because it is faith that you use to log into God's Wi-Fi to be able to download the blessings that have been made available. So it says, God loved and gave, but you must have a password. If you know how to sense, you can sense that there, is, there, is a, there are blessings in the atmosphere. But if you do not have a way of plugging into that Wi-Fi, you can never download the file. And some of you are looking like that. You come here and you feel like people are getting blessed. People are getting blessed. People are getting promoted. People are changing. But there is something that you are lacking called password. Your password is your faith. So it says, whoever believes, they begin to enjoy the blessings that God has provided. So believing is something we have been called to do every single day. One of the reasons why we come to church is so that our faith may be strengthened. So that our faith may be strengthened. Having said that, I want to recommend that every activity we do in this house, because of that truth, should be a faith-building activity. Let us not do things here that will discourage people's faith. Let us only do things that will help people to grow their faith. Everything that happens in church should be a faith-building activity. Everything that we do. The way we talk, the way we, the way we preach, the way we sing, the way we carry ourselves. Let it be that somebody will see that and have their faith strengthened. Because one of the things that we come to do in church is so that our faith may be strengthened. So when I was praying about this service, I told God, I want it that by the time the service is ending, people's faith will be strengthened. Now, if this service comes to an end and that thing has not happened to you, then I know that there is a problem somewhere. Because one of the things I came to do is to challenge your faith. You will not believe God the same way you have been believing. You are going to rise. You are going to improve the quality of your faith. Because faith is one of those very important things. In the economy of God, faith ranks very, very high. You know, there are five things. There are five things that God does not ignore. I'm going to mention them quickly. Five things that when a man wears, when a man wears those things, God does not ignore him. Number one, faith. Number one is faith. If you show up before God with faith, he does not know how to ignore you. Because God is pleased with faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. God is pleased with faith. Now, this pleasing is some kind of excitement. Some kind of what? Excitement. People who have faith, they excite God. Do you know Jesus would stop because he has seen a man of faith and he begins to address the man. Yet there is a whole congregation of people following him. It happened with Bartimaeus. It happened with the woman with the issue of blood. It happened with everybody that showed faith. Those men were dropping a man from the roof. Jesus stopped preaching for them. He said, this kind of faith. Every time Jesus saw men of faith, his attention was drawn to them. He stopped doing what he was doing so that he can attend to that which gives him pleasure. So one of the ways of giving God pleasure is to have faith. This week, I want you to develop a program for giving God pleasure. Monday between 5 and 6.30, I am going to be giving God pleasure by having faith in him. Or doing things that will strengthen my faith. Faith gives God pleasure. The Bible says, if you read the book of um, the book of Hebrews, was it Hebrews where we have that line that says, "Without faith." Hebrews eleven six. The line that follows. I'm trying to look for it. The line that follows. There is a place which says. Uh, and those who draw back, my soul does not have pleasure in them. Somebody find me that. Hebrews 11, it must be 
10 or something. Just after that. Have you seen it? Okay, I'll just find it because it's somewhere in my notes. It actually talks about pleasure. Let me find it because I think I have it in the book. Hebrews 10, 38. Oh, this one comes earlier. It says this. Now, the just shall live by faith. But if any man draws back, if any man draws back, it says, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Are you seeing? This is God speaking. If any man draws back, drawing back means to doubt, to question. If any man draws back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So one of the ways of giving God pleasure is to have faith. So one of the things that God does not ignore is this thing called faith. Number two, the other thing that God does not ignore is this thing called humility. Humility. The scripture says that if my people who are called by my name will do what? Will humble themselves and then pray. <laughs> The condition, the condition of that is humility. Just like the condition of John 3.16 is faith. So when you humble yourself, you can pray. If you pray before humbling yourself, that your prayer is not going. I'm telling you the truth. It will not go. Humility precedes prayer. You cannot say that I'm beginning to pray when you have not humbled yourself. How do you even pray? And prayer itself is actually... Is actually supposed to be to be to be done on the platform of humility. How do you pray in pride? Have you seen the way people who are asking for assistance in pride, the way they don't get what they're asking for? Because asking for help does not work together with pride. Proud people cannot be given all they are asking for. And proud people do not ask because pride in itself is like a wall. Pride is like a wall. So if I want to enter. Assuming this, the other side there is a room. I want to enter. And I am a, a person of pride. I will try to enter through here. But a person of humility will go there. Where the door is. So humility is a door. Pride is a wall. Humility is a door. Pride is a, pride is a wall. So you cannot pray until you humble yourself. And if you pray in pride, it is like noise. It is a dirty prayer. It is like insulting the president. You see? If you show up praying and you are proud, God does not know how to... It, is a, it smells bad. It smells very bad. If you read the story of the Pharisee and that, and that sinner that were praying before God, one of them was humbling himself. Another one was beating his chest up. That is, that is a picture of Pride and humility, praying before God. And that is how some of us do. If you want to touch the heart of God with your prayer, humble yourself first. In fact, humility is prayer. Humility is prayer. Even if you don't say, uh, you don't say many things, the moment you have humbled yourself is like you're praying. Whatever you are desiring will be given to you. Because you have humbled yourself. God pays attention to humility. And he has given us the formula here. If my people who are called by my name, imagine you are a person of God called by the name of God. Yet he says, humble yourself. So the fact that you are called by his name does not guarantee you uh, access to the things you want. There is something else called humility. If you don't humble, you cannot get it. And you can't pray. You remember the times you prayed in pride and you felt like uh, it is me. I'm now telling God about myself. You know, those prayers don't go far. So if you want to draw the attention of God, be a humble man. You will have the attention of God. The third thing that God pays attention to is this thing called righteousness. If you are a righteous man, it is like a sweet-smelling aroma. God comes in your camp to check on you. There are people that God visits. But then there are people who visit God. 
unataka kukuwa kwa kategori gani? Eh? Unataka kuwa kategori gani? Ya wale wa kutembelea Mungu ama Mungu wa kutembelea? Unajua ni vizu, unajua ina, do you know how it feels when God visits you? Eh? Mungu amewacha mashughuli, amekuja kukuona. Unaendeleaje? Siku imekuwaaje? Biashara iko vipi? Wateja wanakupelekaje? Hiyo blessing nili release jana unaionaje? That is what God does when he is visiting. But there are some of us who we must visit God to see him. Me I want to be visited by God. I want God to visit me. I want nishtukio tu the presence of God is here. Like Jacob is just sleeping in some wilderness some place. And then he wakes up and he discovers the presence of God is here. Where the man is sleeping. Not even in a five star hotel in some place in the desert with a piece of rock used as a pillow. God is there with Jacob. Do you know how beautiful that is? That's why I told you walking in the company of God is such a powerful thing. Now, if you are a person of righteousness, God looks for you. The eyes of the Lord are looking back and forth for people. Righteous that he can show himself strong on their behalf. Number four, one thing that God does not ignore, obedience. Obedience. I'm telling you, the Bible says, obedience is better than? Yes. So if you come here with a sacrifice of a hundred million, and me, I come here with my obedience, I will pass. <laughs> I will pass. That statement, obedience is better than sacrifice, was given in the context where somebody gave a huge sacrifice of animals, but out of disobedience. And God said, me, I'm not interested in those things you're doing. Some of us seated here have been sacrificing a lot. But our obedience scale is just, is just here. This is the secret. Check your obedience. Because in the economy of God, it is not about how much you do. It is about how good you are with obeying what God wants to be done. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Even if people bring more than you do, if you obey better than them, you are blessed. I'm telling you. You are so blessed. When God begins to mention the names of the people in his hall of fame, because God has his list of hall of fame, your name will be mentioned. Your name will be mentioned. If you obey, your name will be mentioned. The last thing is this thing called zeal. 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 The book of Numbers 25, there is a story of a man there called Phineas. I love that man. If you read Numbers 25, I think from verse 10 or 11 there, how Phineas burnt with zeal for God. If you read that story, I love it. If you read that story, you will be shocked. You will be so shocked how a man, how a man got blessings. The man was not praying. The man was not doing what? He was not even praying. He just saw something. Let me read that story for you because I love it. Zeal. Phineas. Okay, I'll read from verse 1. I'll read very fast. And Israel abode. No, I'll read from verse 3. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay every one of these men, to slay every one of his men that were joined to Baal. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They were trying to humble themselves that the anger of God goes away. And then there is a certain man who comes there. Joining themselves to Baal means that they went into prostitution and they went into, adult, um, into idol worshipping. And when Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand 
And he went after the man of Israel into the, into the tent and thrust both of them, that is the man and the Midianite woman, the man of Israel and, and the woman through her belly, so that the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned my wrath away from the children of Israel while he was zealous for my sake among them that I consumed not the children of Israel. Wherefore say, behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace and he shall have it and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood because he was zealous for his God and he made an atonement for the children of Israel. Do you, do you see how this man picked his blessing? He was just zealous for God. He saw the wrong thing being done. And because he was burning with, with zeal for God, the zeal for righteousness, he went and killed that man and the woman. Just that. So a man is being blessed because he killed. <laughs> yeah? That is bloody killing. Javelin. Ile kitu inaitua javelin. Aka... Because of the zeal for God. And God is blessing him with a covenant of peace. <laughs> him and his children. Look at that. You know, Phineas was not praying. That was not a prayer session. It was not. It was just a man who was zealous for God. And because of what he did, the anger of God was subsided. But beyond that, he was blessed. Phineas was blessed because of that act of killing that man. So there are some things that God does not ignore. So I was trying to show you those things so that you can know. When you go to pray, press on important issues. Don't press on these issues of, of money and rent and food and clothes. It is okay to have those things. But I'm telling you, if you press on the important issues, those other things you're asking for will be added to you. if you So one of the things you want to press is the issue of faith. Lord, increase my faith. This has to be your prayer. Lord, increase my faith. Even if you'll pray that prayer for 10 years, you pray that prayer. Because faith is one of those keys. I've shown you the other ones. Faith is that... One of those important keys, and I think for me that's the central key, because it is the connector. Faith is a connector that brings a binds us together with God. When you have entered into faith with God, you have been joined together with Him. So you and God are one. It is faith that brings you into that. You and God are one. So your experiences become the experiences of God, and the experiences of God become your experiences. People who have been joined by God, you cannot kill them. You cannot kill them. They tried to kill Daniel. Actually, they were going to kill him. Now, if you read the story of Daniel, the pattern of how things are happening, it is the same. The same with the story of, of Joseph. It is the same. It is the same with the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It is the same with the story of Joshua. It is the same with the story of Gideon. The pattern remains the same. That is going to be the last thing I'm going to be reading so that we, we, we see how that works. In the book of John 6 and 29, the Bible says, Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you may believe on him who he has sent. They were asking Jesus, so, so show us the work of God. What should we do? as the work of God. Do you know the way we do things here and we say, I am doing the work of God? I am sweeping the church, the work of God. I am carrying the... Where is your speaker? It's somewhere there. There are people who carry those things. Yes. I don't know what you call them in this church. But kuna watu mungu wa mwapatia yu neema ya kubebaga. Anabeba meza, anabeba hii, anabeba hii, anabeba hii chuma, anabeba hii. Anakwambia pasi usi jali na yu, yu nitabeba. Eh, unakuta imeletwa kabla hujafika wako na neema ya kube kubeba 
working for God. They are called, they are called what? Stand up. <laughs> you know, it's a department in many ministries. It's a good thing. And God blesses them, Kabisa. But I'm telling you, beyond that, there is something here that Jesus is saying. The work of God. He says, this is the work of God that you may believe. Bonus if you So kazi ya Mungu ni kufanya kuamini. Ukisema ninafanya kazi ya Mungu na hujaamini ama kuamini is not part of that program. You know you are out of order. You are completely out of order. Ukiosha gari ya pasi na unasema hii ni kazi ya nafanya kazi ya Mungu na hauamini Mungu, you are out of order. You are out of order. If you sweep the church and you arrange the chairs and you wipe them clean, but you don't believe, you are out of order. There are many people who come to church, but they are out of order. I declare today that we are all getting back to order. I declare in Jesus' name that we are all getting back to order. The order of the children of God is to believe. Everything else you are doing should be an addition onto your faith. It should be an addition onto your faith. Because that is what the Bible says that we should do. If you read the book of 2 Peter, I think chapter 1 and verse 5, building on, adding onto your faith, there are some things that are said that we should add onto our faith. But faith is the foundation. Faith is the foundation. So add on to your faith playing the keyboard. That is going to be a man who is in order. Add on to your faith sweeping the church. That is a man that is in order. Add on to your faith carrying these things in and out. Beautiful. You are in order. Because the work, the work of God is to do what? To believe. To believe. Believing is what we do daily. Every day is a believing day. Every day is a believing day. Before you sleep in the night, make sure that you have been believing. Do not let any single day pass and you have not believed God or you have not done something that strengthens your faith. So that means that now we shall begin to read the scriptures differently. Read this thing so that you can strengthen your faith. There is a part in the Bible, I'm not remembering, but Jesus Christ said, all these things have been written so that you may, you may believe. Let me see if I can get it. Because even Jesus was answering that. I'm just going to look for it quickly. So that the way we read scriptures is supposed to be helping our faith. We read scriptures so that we can help our faith. Okay. John 20, 31. John 20 and verse 31. The day I saw that verse, I changed the way I read my Bible. I'm just going to read that line for you. It says, Um, it says but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ the son of God and that believing you must have life through his name whatever is written here why was it written so that we may we may believe Everything that is written here is supposed to nourish our faith. So how do you read your Bible? You read it so that you can pick things that can strengthen your faith. Read the story of Jacob so that you can see how a man walks with God. And God fights for them. So that after you have read that, you can also be strengthened in your faith to walk with God. sana. See how God answered the prayer of Sarah for a child so that you may believe that God answers prayers. Read the miracles that were documented 
in the Gospels so that you may believe. One of the ways we read the Bible wrongly is to look for scriptures. And everybody has a, has a way of highlighting the scriptures that bless your heart. <laughs> everybody has a highlighter, so they highlight something in the Bible. These are the ones that, when I am down, when I am down, I go to Psalm 23. So that I can encourage myself. It is not bad to encourage yourself. But it is better use of scriptures if you strengthen your faith. Yes. Because there is a time you will go through a test. And the only thing that keeps you in God is the faith you have. There is a time even encouraging yourself does not, does not, does not cool down the test. You continue in the test. Have you ever been tested? Mpaka uombe, uombe kabisa. Na mungu na kuambia tu my grace will be sufficient. That means sitoi hiyo kitu. Inaendelea kukudunga du. Lakini, my grace is sufficient. If your faith is strong, if not, if is weak, you will give up. You will give up. Even when God says, my grace is sufficient for you. Because we have been conditioned to believe that in, in, in Christianity we should not suffer. No, sometimes you suffer. It's like a mother who is going to give birth. And they are told, you carry a blessing. But you know how that blessing comes out? Pain. <laughs> so when women are praying for children... Sometimes they are not, they don't remember. Itafika mahali, utapiga nduru utukane watu, uite watu majina mbaya mbaya, but that is just the process of receiving the blessing. So you strengthen your faith so that when the moment of birthing comes, you don't give up. Women who attempt to give up when they are giving birth, they are slapped badly. They are slapped so badly. Utachapu wakufi huko na oma nurses. Wakuambia wewe ni pumbavu, unataka kuhuwa mtoto. Baka unashanga wa mnani chapia? Na wiyo zini mtoto wangu. <laughs> Wana kutuanga kofi. Wana tuangu wangu wa kofi sometimes. So, the things that we read in this are supposed to strengthen your faith. Find a way of seeing scriptures the right way. Honor your key to come an opportunity to strengthen your faith. One day I was asking myself, so why was this written? Have you ever asked yourself, you read something in the Bible and you wonder, so what is the reason for that? It is so that it can strengthen your faith. Everything that is written here is so that it can strengthen your faith. Finally, there is a man called Daniel. Daniel is a good man, I love him. Daniel ran into trouble because of the faith he had in God. If you read the book of Daniel chapter 6, you will see the story there. They threw him into the lion's den because he refused to compromise. He kept praying to his God. He kept praying three times and that was offensive to the law of the land. So they threw him in the lion's den as a way of destroying him. For violating the law of the land. The story about those lions and that den was that that den was a place of destruction. Every time they threw in a man, he was eaten. Every time. Actually, immediately after Daniel, when they removed him and they threw the accusers, the Bible says, Atta hawa jafika wapi? Chini. They did not even touch the ground. The lions tore them when they were still in the air coming down. So that place was a place of destruction. So Daniel was supposed to be destroyed. The intention of them putting him in that den was destruction. And he was being destroyed because he refused to compromise his faith. I have a question for you. If the Al-Shabaab guys walk into this door with guns, today. So, aseme, we are going to kill all of you unless you denounce God. And if you denounce God, we allow you to pass. Hapa. Hii ni hii iko na mlango mmoja, so hakuna kuhepa. 
Na hizi madirisha dirisha hizi sioni kama zinatoshia wengi wetu hapa. There are some of us hii dirisha isaidi. Hii dirisha wachana nayo. Usiniambie maneno hiyo dirisha. It is not an option. So they say denounce or die. Denounce or die. Just like they did for Daniel. I do not want to ask that question. But ask yourself, would you be willing for the sake of your faith to be killed? And you know the way they do it is slowly, slowly. Deny. No. Poop. They kill you. So the rest of the people will say, hey, Pasia me kufa, by the way. <laughs> Pasia me die. Hey, iki tu naonekana ni serious. And then they go to him. Denounce. And then you denounce. Then they leave you. And they say, that man, has, that man is still alive. The difference between him and Pasia, Pasia me die. Why? So they kill one by one. So that the rest of us can slowly process the reality of the moment. How many of you seated here, sincerely speaking, would accept to die for your faith? This is what Daniel was put through. Daniel said, it's okay, you throw me in the den. And he went without denouncing. And he stayed there the whole night without denouncing. The whole night, I denounced I'm a relaxed too. I know it was a tense moment even for him. It was a tense moment. But in the morning when the king came, because the king was troubled the whole night, so very early in the morning he came and he asked a very important question and I love it. I love that question that he asked in the morning. Um... 19. Then the king rose very early in the morning, Daniel chapter 6, and went in haste to the den. And when he came to the den, he cried with a, a lamentable voice unto Daniel and said, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom you serve continually able to deliver you from the lion? Look at, that. Look at the way he's framing that question. He sounds like a spiritual man. Is the God who you have been serving continually. That is an emphasis of what I said, that we are supposed to believe continually. Every day is a believing day. So Daniel was known to be an everyday believer. Every day, they knew Daniel is a believer. He prayed three times a day. There is no single day he did not do that as a way of demonstrating his faith. Every day. So that is how they describe Daniel. This man serves God continually. What a way to describe a man. This man prays continually. This man goes to church continually. This man reads his Bible continually. This man gives continually. This man obeys God continuously. This man he humbles himself Continually. Yani, every day for Daniel, that is a pattern of his life. And that is how he is supposed to be. Every day is a believing day. Every day like Daniel. So that is how the king is describing him. And then Daniel says, Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth and they have not hurt me. For as much as before before him, innocency was found in me, was found in me, and also before thee, O king, I have done no hurt. Then the king was glad and commanded that they should take Daniel out. So this man, Daniel, is an example to us. Why was the story of Daniel written? So that we may believe. So that we may believe. So when they threw him in there, they were testing his faith. So when I told you that faith binds you with God and you become one, I meant that when you are bonded with God in faith, when you believe him, he becomes a part of your life. So that destruction cannot destroy you. This was supposed to be destruction for Daniel. But they could not destroy him. Because the angel of God was with Daniel. You know when the angel of God is with you, what was intended to destroy you cannot destroy you. 
That is why those lions could not. They could not devour him. But when they removed Daniel and replaced him with other men who were not believers of God, do you know what happened to them? They were destroyed. So, our faith binds us with God and we become one. So that now, the experiences of our lives become the experiences of God. If you are being persecuted, God says they are persecuting him. You know, when God, when God was striking Saul on his way to Damascus, Saul was persecuting the church, people. But do you know how the question was framed? Why are you persecuting me? The voice said, why are you persecuting me? Saul was not persecuting Christ. He was persecuting people, believers. But because they were bonded with God into one, persecution that affected them was persecution affecting God. That is how powerful it is to believe in God. You are bonded with him. So when somebody insults you, they have insulted God. When somebody fights you, they are fighting God. When somebody favors you, they are favoring God. That is why if you do good to a righteous man, you will be blessed. Because the God they serve will be pleased with your actions and they will reward you on their behalf. That is why we are charged to believe. So when you believe, when you believe, you are preserved. The Bible says, and whoever believes in him should not perish. So one of the advantages you enjoy, one of the profits you enjoy is the blessing of preservation. Is the blessing of preservation. And that is why I am charging us to believe. To believe. Because when you believe, you begin to profit. Hebrews 4, 2 it says, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. But the word preached did not profit them because they did not mix it with faith when they had it. So when you mix what you hear with faith, you stand to profit. So one of the things you, you profit is the blessing of preservation. When you believe, you are preserved. And then it also says that they shall not perish but have everlasting life. The other blessing of believing God is the blessing of life. You have continuity of life. God blesses you with life. Bonus if you are sana. People who believe God cannot be put to shame. People who believe God cannot be put to shame. You cannot ashamed a man who believes God. People who believe God are overcomers. We overcome the, wor the world with the word of our, of our testimony and our faith. So when you have believed God, you are an overcomer. Believing God gives you a platform of experiencing God. You cannot experience God outside faith. You cannot until you enter into faith. Outside of faith, you cannot touch God. So faith is a precondition of experiencing God. Those who come to him must believe that he is. Believing gives us a platform for transacting with God. In fact, the book of Romans chapter 14 and verse 23 says, anything done out of faith, anything, done, anything not done in faith is sin. Anything that is done that you do, that you did not do in faith, is considered sinful and unacceptable to God. You know? Your prayers are answered on the basis of faith. Jesus says, if you, when you pray, believe. And that you which you have prayed, you shall receive. It is a very simple thing. You cannot receive it until you believe. So faith gives us a platform to transact with God. Faith is the basis of our relationship with God. Even the way we start our relationship with God is first of all, Believing in our hearts and confessing 
with our mouth. So a man cannot tell you have a relationship with God until they enter into faith. Once you have entered into faith, you have built a base for a relationship with God. And everything that happens after that continues in faith. We don't believe God once and then we stop. We believe and then we continue. Bonus if you sana. Because we are supposed to build ourselves on the most holy faith. Onto your faith add this and that and that. The book of 2 Peter chapter 1, you will read that and see from verse 5. So faith becomes the platform on which we transact with God. It becomes the currency. It's like money by which we buy from God. By faith, we gain the power to please God. You see? We become the people of God's pleasure. So when God wants pleasure, he wants to be entertained, he looks for believers. And he listens to their praises. And he looks at the worship they are giving and the sacrifices. That is how God, that is how God gets pleasure from us. Buon as if you son. Um, faith brings salvation. Romans 6, Roman 1, 16 to 17. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. Everyone that believes. It is through faith that we enjoy the blessing of salvation. So those who believe shall be saved. It is written. Those who believe shall be saved. Salvation is not received in any other way. There are many ways to accessing God. That's a lie. It is, it is believing in God. It is believing in God. Salvation comes by us believing in God. Faith gives us the ability to have our prayers answered. Mark 11, 24. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received and it shall be yours. So in my opinion, believing is more powerful than praying. Believing, it is more powerful than praying. Because you can pray. You can pray and you still don't get it if your prayer is not mixed with, with faith. But if you believe, even if you don't pray, you will get it. Like the woman with the issue of blood. She didn't pray. She just said to herself, me, I'm going to touch. And she touched. So believing is the most powerful form of prayer. Believing is the most powerful form of prayer. If somebody prays for 10 hours and me, I believe for like one minute. <laughs> You know, if you pray and you're praying without believing, you are yeni mali. And many people make a mistake. Let me tell you something. The strength of your prayer is not determined by how long. It is how strong you believe. Yes. Kama wani mtuwa kuomba sana, sawa, no problem. Lakini lazimu kuwa mtuwa kuwa mini, sana. Ni kuwa mini, inanetaka resource to prayers. You know? The power of prayer comes from the answers of God. Men are not powerful prayer warriors. No. We only pray to a powerful God. The only way to access this God is believing. A child can believe and pray for two minutes. Now, we are going to a mountain. We are going to a mountain. We are to three weeks. We are mountain. Paka unarudi kama umeparara kabisa. Lakini kama huko amini, huko kwa mountain, your prayers are null and void. And it is not me who is nullifying them. It is your lack of faith. It is your lack of faith that is nullifying them. So believe, build your faith. If you are going to pray, believe fast. I'm telling you, if you pray without believing, you're wasting time. Believe fast. Then pray. Believe, then pray. Yes. 
Um, by believing you are given the power or the right to become children of God. John chapter 1 and verse 12. As many as believed him, he gave them the power to become the children of God. Look at how powerful believing in God is. There are many things that we enjoy. There are many things that we enjoy. If you believe God, you become a child of God. The Bible says in Mark 9.23 that all things are possible to them that believe. All things. Now this statement, all things, does it not cover that list of you as I was talking about at the beginning? He all things, he, he may cover your list. So if you press on faith only and tell God, increase my faith, then you know you are, you are, you are praying for all the things that you've been desiring to get from God. Because all things are possible to them that believe. Faith causes our desires to be granted. Matthew 15, 28. Then Jesus answered and told, and told her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. So faith makes it possible for our desires to be granted. Everybody over, every one of us walks around with some desire. Kila mtu wakonaka desire kake. Kuna wale wanataka nyumba, kuna wale wanataka watoruwa wa succeed, kuna wale wanataka gari. There is a time I used to desire a car. Right now I don't desire a car because I have it already. <laughs> I stopped desiring. Sinikonayo. So nikianza desire ingine, maybe it will be for another model of a car. But there is a time I was desiring a car. I was desiring a car. And I used to tell God, this is the kind of car that I want to drive. Even the color I, I knew. So I would describe it. So, because of the fact that I was talking to God about it. Let me give you a secret of success. If there is something you're dealing with, don't tell people about it. Tell God. Tell God. You know, if I come and tell you something, I am believing you. I am making you to be the source of the thing I want. It is good to tell your parents and your, and your partner and your, and, and your important people. But I'm telling you, the most important person to tell the story of your desires is who? Is God. Please tell God your desires. Iki kufinya, enda wambia mungu, inanifinya. Iki kufraisha, ambia mungu. Change the people that you have been telling the stories of your desire. If you want to succeed well, make God the person who hears the story of your desire. Na ukisha ambia mungu, wachana na hawa watu wengine. Wachana na hawa kabisa. Because God can still tell them if he wants to use them. He can still tell them to do it for you. The reason why this is important is sometimes you do not know who God is going to use to bless you. Or you do not know the person that is supposed to deliver the blessing to you. So if the person that is supposed to deliver the blessing is in the U.S. The person is in the U.S. Na we ni ule mtu wakuambia. Sa utamuambia aje. So where will you get them? Are you seeing how difficult that is? But you know if you tell it to God, God will tell them. I have friends in the U.S. I have friends in the U.S. That God has used to do me things that I told God. I did not tell them. Sometimes I wake up in, and they usually send me money. I have, I have friends in the US. They are not family members. We are not related in any way. Kabisa. But God has connected us. So one day I woke up in the morning. And I saw my, a message in M-Pesa. Somebody had sent me a lot of money in the M-Pesa. And I had told God about my need for money. So, I wrote to them and I told them, hey, I have received some money from you. Is there anything that you want me to do for you with that money? Because sometimes they send money so that, you know, can do some few things for them here. Then they said, 
I just felt impressed in my heart to send you that money. I did not ask for the money from them. I told God my need. And God spoke to them. The day I discovered that secret, I stopped telling people my desires. I tell God what I want. Pastor, do you know that I told God about this meeting before we talked? Yes. <laughs> there is a time I prayed at the beginning of this year for, for God to open for me doors in seven places. And this is one of those places. <laughs> at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of the year. Now, this is when you are knowing. If I had not talked like this, you would never have known because I was not going to say it. So I told God, I want you to open doors for me in this and this and this place. And then I let it stay in his hands. I let it stay in his hands. And I continue to prepare for the door. So let your desires be known to God. Let your desires be known to to God. Because he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above. You know there is no other person who has that qualification that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above. It is only God. So if you have a desire for something, tell God. Ambia tu mungu peke yake na yo story ishi hapo. When you tell God your desires, you are actually making a statement that God I believe you. And I believe you are capable of doing this thing for me. But when you start telling human beings those things that you are supposed to tell God, you are provoking God to jealousy. So that instead of that blessing coming, it is going to be a fight. Because when you make something take the position of God, you are inviting that thing into battle with God. That is why God was fighting that God called Dagon in the night. In the night when people are sleeping, God came to a place where they had placed the Ark of the, um, is, is the, Ark of the Covenant. Yes, and because they placed that Ark together with a, the, their God called Dagon. Go read that story in the Bible. In the night. So God came and dropped that thing. In the morning they woke up and said, hey, then they stood it up. In the night again, God came and dropped it and broke the head and the arms. And then they realize that God is fighting. That is what happens. When you replace God with a human being, God will begin to fight that person. That person will be fought because of you. So don't make your husband your God. Love your husband. Respect them. Honor them. But don't make them your God. Love your wife. Respect them. Honor them. But don't make them your God. Love your parents, honor them, but don't make them your God. Even your ancestors, love them if you want to love them. But don't pray to them. Don't pray to them because you are inviting God into war. And you know you cannot win. Who wins against God? Don't pray to the spirits of your forefathers. Don't pray to them. Just say, I am a descendant of so and so. My people came from this place. That is where we are found. The bones of our forefathers were buried in this place. But never pray to them. If you pray to them, you shall be defeated. I'm telling you the truth. Because nobody has ever won that war. That's why I told you, everything that has been written here is supposed to instruct us and guide us to strengthen our faith in God. Even if you read about witchcraft here, it is not for you to believe in witchcraft. It is for you to believe in God. Because even witchcraft, God defeats witchcraft. In the time of Moses, there were witches. Witches, serious witches. They would make a stick to turn into a snake. You come and squeeze it, witches come how? Moses anatupa yake chini, pa, au pia wanaweka yao, pa. Wanatosha na nguvu. Lakini sasa, ile ya Musa inakula hizo zingi, ndi waonyesho ya kwamba, hii kona nguvu kuliko hizo zenu. So God was winning in every battle because God is a very jealous God. Very jealous. Don't pray to the spirits of your forefathers. If 
you call yourself a child of God, don't do that. Pray to God only. Pray to God only. Even if you want to sing songs for your forefathers, just sing. But never pray to them. Your faith should be in God. So our desires are granted when we believe. Um, as I finish, Matthew 17, 20. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So faith gives us the power to move things. Do you know how beautiful it is to move things? <laughs> how many of you have moved things? Yeah, if you have done building, you know that sometimes you buy land and then you see a lot of takataka, miti me 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 apo, nasema aya. Slash you, move them that way. We want to put a house there. Then where there were bushes, suddenly you plant a house. That is how moving things looks like. You know? Sometimes when you get good money, you move. You move from a one, from a single room house to a two bedroom house. Do you know how powerful that movement is? You feel like, eh? <laughs> I know you know what I'm saying. You feel like something has happened. So faith gives you power to move things. Because faith is a force. Faith is a force. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 16. Above all, carry the shield of faith so that you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. So faith, we use it as a defensive um, um, a weapon. By it, you extinguish the arrows of the devil. Because the devil does not know how to fight with people whose faith cannot be weakened. You know, when a man has stood his ground, the devil does not know what to do with them. Yani na kuwatu mission impossible. The devil only works on people who he convinces to doubt God or to question God. Or to, to go back on their commitment on God. But when you are firm in your faith, everything the devil throws your way, it gets extinguished. Because your faith is unwavering. Now if you look at Abraham, who is a model for us, one of the things that he said about him in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 is that he did not waver in his faith. God said, I'll bless you with a son. The man never doubted that. He never questioned that. God told him, go and kill that boy now. He was going. He was going. He did not, he did not launch a petition. That he, oh God, you know, Sasa, I'm old, Sasa, itakuwaje. No. He just said, we go, we go. He was going to kill the boy. Because his faith in God is unwavering. So that is how we are supposed to stand in our faith. By it, we extinguish the attacks from the enemy. It is a shield. Your faith is a shield. That is why I told you, faith is an important thing. And all of us must work to strengthen our faith. Everybody be on your feet.